Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Doc Talk. Uh, today with us we have Dr. Vosser and I'm going to ask him to introduce himself. Hello, my name is Dr. David Vossler, and I'm medical director for adult neurology services and medical director of our level four epilepsy center here at Valley Medical Center. And I'm also a um, clinical professor of neurology at University of Washington, and I'm vice chair of the Council on Clinical Activities for the American Epilepsy Society. It's my uh, passion and pleasure to talk to you about epilepsy and seizures. Um, it's a field that I've been involved in for 40 years, so I hope you find this informative. Uh, my plan is to really talk about the different kinds of seizures. Um, as you see here, there are actually 10 types of seizures. Um, and then we'll talk about the epilepsies that cause those seizures. And there are actually 40 types of epilepsies. Just to be sure you know, there's no quiz at the end, so don't worry. And we won't go over all 40 of them. I just want to present the ideas to you so you have a rough, uh, better understanding, I guess I should say, of the different kinds of epilepsy. Uh, today we have um, many, many new seizure medications, anti-seizure medications. We're up to 33, so there's lots of choices. And we have also devices to treat epilepsy, three different devices. And we have um, about 10 different kinds of surgeries that we can do. Um, so we'll go over all of those and I'll make sure to put this in lay terms so that everyone can understand. Um, so what's the difference between seizures and epilepsy? Well, um, seizures are a sign or a symptom of some kind of disorder. Um, so, for example, if you had asthma, that's the disorder, um, you could have coughing, you could have chest tightness, you could have shortness of breath. Uh, those are symptoms and signs. Likewise, epilepsy is the disorder. It's the condition that the person has. Maybe that's you. Um, and seizures are one aspect, one aspect of what goes on in epilepsy. There are many other aspects, okay? So people can uh, often have uh, trouble with their memory. They can have um, depression. They can have worry, fear, anxiety. Um, they might uh, have trouble just thinking in general, trouble organizing themselves. Um, and often um, the medications that we use, sadly, uh, do cause uh, side effects that can affect people as well. Uh, on top of all of that, you have social and uh, job-related problems. Um, you, you can't drive if you have seizures. You have to be free of seizures for six months before you can drive in the state of Washington. Um, you have to um, um, you know, take your medications. You have to be able to get to the store. You have to be able to get to the doctor. So transportation is a problem. Uh, oftentimes it's hard to work, maybe impossible to work. Um, and so people um, sometimes uh, have to go on disability. Uh, people uh, often don't socialize as much. Um, they may not get married and have families as much if they have epilepsy. So our goal is a simple one. Stop the seizures. With, and hopefully no side effects so that people can get past this burden and get on to a normal lifestyle. Um, I should point out here early that um, about two thirds of people um, can be controlled with medication, completely controlled with medication, but one third cannot uh, easily be controlled with medication. And so that's where uh, top level, level four epilepsy centers like ours can come into play because we, we really can help the people who are struggling um, who have medication resistant epilepsy. So um, this might be a little bit too busy, um, but I want you to just get an awareness of the different kinds of seizures. And um, you can ignore the right-hand column and just focus on the left, left-hand columns, if you will. So uh, seizures come in different flavors. It's kind of like going to the ice cream store and there's, there's many flavors to choose from. In this case, there's 10 different kinds of seizures. Um, so they break down into two categories though. I guess you could think of it as real ice cream and frozen yogurt. Let's start with a real ice cream example over on uh, the left here. Uh, I'm gonna use my pointer and I hope you can see that. So there's focal onset seizures. Focal means there's a focus, a spot uh, where the seizures come from in the brain. They start in a focus in the brain. I'm 
pointing to the right temporal area under here, under this part of my scalp, would be the temporal lobe of the brain. That's the most common lobe to produce epilepsy. Um, second most common is the frontal lobe. And third and fourth are the parietal and the occipital lobes. They can come from the right side or can come from the left side. So I guess you could say there's four lobes on each side. So there's eight possible general uh, locations in the brain or foci, foci where these can come from. So taking focal onset seizures here, uh, the column A or the ice cream column, if you will, um, they break down into focal aware seizures. Uh, and focal aware seizures can be uh, just a sensation uh, or it could be just a movement like a, a, a jerking of the hand. Um, but the patient is fully aware and able to talk and remember everything that's happening. Those used to be called simple partial seizures. And maybe you were aware of that. Maybe you've been taught that in the past. But the, the names changed in 2017, uh, April of 2017. So it's coming up on three and a half years when we want to move everybody over to talking about focal onset seizures, not partial onset seizures. So the other uh, category that's more serious are impaired awareness. So we call them focal impaired awareness seizures, FIAS, or you can also call them focal unaware seizures for short. I prefer that because it's a little shorter. So focal unaware seizures um, may start with the same symptoms and feelings or twitching um, that occurs on the aware category, but it progresses into impaired awareness where the person um, is really not responding normally. They're not unconscious, but they're just not able to respond to you appropriately. And they may do odd things. They may smack their lips and swallow. They may uh, pick at things. They may try to reach out. If you talk to them um, and ask them to do something or respond, they may not say anything or they may say, huh? huh? And they kind of look at you blankly. Now, both of these aware and unaware focal onset seizures uh, tend to last 30 seconds to maybe two minutes, but not much longer than that. After the aware seizures, patients are normal again. They're quickly back to normal and they go, oh, it's over now. Boy, I really, I hate that. I don't like that. But the focal impaired awareness seizures are confused for a period of time after it's over. And that's called the post-ictal, that means after seizure, period. Now, uh, I mentioned that I'm going to go back here with my pointer and I hope you can see that to the left here, there's motor onset, that means movement onset and there's non-motor onset, maybe sensation, maybe a feeling in your mind, an odd feeling in your body, rising feeling in your stomach, whatever. So there's two different ways those can begin. But the third type of seizure and the worst one in this category is the ones that begin in a focal way and spread from that focus to the whole brain, and then they become a convulsion. So it's a focal to bilateral, both sides, tonic, that's stiffening, clonic, convulsion. Those are the worst, and uh, they, people will fall with them. Um, they can get injured, they can bite their tongue. Um, after it's over, they uh, will have amnesia. Uh, sometimes they'll have things like headache. They may uh, wet their pants uh, because they, you know, after they have a big convulsion like that, it's exhausting. Their whole body, all their muscles, including the bladder muscle, relaxes, and sometimes out comes some urine. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in, uh, in a few minutes. Now, generalized onset seizures here, moving to the uh, second column uh, of basic types of seizures. Uh, again, I, I guess I called this the frozen yogurt column as opposed to the focal onset, which is your ice cream column. You have a few different flavors um, in the frozen yogurt column, okay? So you have generalized onset seizures. That means the seizure comes from the whole brain everywhere, front and back, side to side, everywhere all in once. It's like, uh, at once. It's like a tree that has a string of lights wrapped around it. If you plug that, um, plug that string of lights in, the whole tree is going to light up at once. Uh, and that's really what happens with generalized onset seizures. These tend to be genetic or run in families, um, and they are inheritable. Therefore, you can pass it on from one generation to the next. There's a couple of different types here, um, and I'm only going to uh, go over a couple of them. 
Uh, again, you can have those tonic clonic convulsions like I was talking about for the focal side, but uh, they begin with no focal part. They, there's no warning. There's no kind of, oh, I'm feeling it coming. I better sit down. I'm going to take evasive action. I'm going to sit down. There's nothing like that. These, unfortunately, these are really bad because they come on suddenly all at once and people uh, go <clears throat> stiffen and, and frequently fall. And they, uh, because of the falls, they're at risk for significant injury. There's also a couple of more minor types, which I'm going to get into in a later slide. So here's a, a, a little bit of an interesting diagram. This was a doctor um, in New Jersey um, in the 1960s and 70s who uh, went to medical school and he was really good at anatomy, but it turned out he was a really good artist too. He didn't know that, but he found that he was. And he decided to use his skills um, to uh, make illustrations to help teach healthcare providers. So I won't go through all of this for you, but I think it will help a little bit understanding here the focal seizures. His name was Frank Netter, and uh, he was uh, uh, his, he was sponsored by the Seba Geige Company, which is now called Novartis. So anyway, this is sort of historical, but uh, the point is that the brain is broken down into parts. You may know that certain parts of the brain do certain things. For example, if you can see my pointer here, um, this red um, strip um, at the back end, this is the frontal lobe here, this would be the right frontal lobe, this red strip is the movement area of our brain. So if I decide to move my left thumb like this, I'm using my right hand area, my right finger area, which is right about here where my pointer is, to do that. If I stick out my tongue, and I'm not going to do that at you, but if I stick out my tongue, it would be down here. I'd be using this part of my brain, and if I kick you, it would be I'd be using this part of my brain here. So if you have a seizure focus in this part of the brain, let's say right here, okay, in the right part of the right uh, back frontal lobe, you're going to have, when you have a seizure, you're going to have jerking, you know, forcible, what we call clonic jerking of your arm. If it spreads down to your face, you're, you're going to get facial jerking and the head's going to turn this way as well. So that's what's shown, whoops, uh, shown over here. There we go. Okay. Uh, oh, um, there we go. All right. Behind that is the sensation area and the same things apply. You get funny sensations. Um, I had a patient yesterday who was having this in her arm. If it's in the back part of the lobe, uh, excuse me, back part of the brain called the occipital lobe, you get visual distortions. Uh, and, and then if it's over here on the temp top of the temporal lobe, you hear things. If the seizures come from the inside down below here in the inside of the temporal lobe, the, what we call the medial uh, inside of the temporal lobe, um, then that's where you get into these, what we used to call complex partial seizures. Sorry. Uh, uh, or now we call focal impaired awareness seizures. People stare, they have swallowing, lip smacking, chewing, um, they can't talk. Um, and so my point of all of this is not to have, you don't have to remember this, but when you come to see us, we're going to ask you about the symptoms and the signs. Symptoms are things you feel. Signs are something that somebody can see, a doctor, family member, whatever. We're going to ask you about these because we're trying to figure out where in your brain do these seizures come from. Um, that's important to us as neurologists. Now, moving to the generalized category, um, these are what are called absence seizures. Actually, the French uh, gave it the name, so you have to use the French and their absence seizures but you can say absence, so it's fine. <laughs> and um, basically, um, this is a, a, they're a little more common in kids, but they can occur in adults as well uh, because they don't, they sometimes go away, but they don't always go away as people get older. So they don't go away, you'll have it as an adult as well. So the EEG down here on the left side of this thing is normal. Then all of a sudden you get three per second. Every, th uh, th every second you'll have three spike and wave patterns. And um, it's all over. It's on the frontal areas, left and right. It's in the middle areas, left and right. And it's in the back of the brain, left and right. So this is a generalized uh, epileptic seizure. This is a fairly mild kind of seizure, thankfully. 
And these seizures will go on for several seconds and then they'll suddenly stop. And as soon as it's over, little John here will uh, pick his book back up and he'll go on, sometimes unaware that he's even had a seizure. Teachers will often see this in school children and uh, they'll tell the parents, hey, I, I think your child might be having seizures because you know he or she stops, pauses, uh, they often flutter their eyes and then boom, it's over and they're right back. Um, and if they tell you that, please see the doctor and ask them about that. And it's uh, super easy to just do an EEG. It's a painless test. We just glue a little electrodes on the scalp and uh, we can make that diagnosis, get that um, youngster treated and they're on their way. Now, unfortunately, these are the tonic clonic seizures or um, you can also call them, uh, the Spanish term is convulsion. convulsion. Uh, we say convulsions. Um, and they start with, they usually start with a tonic phase. They stiffen out, everything's tonically, uh, rigidly extended um, or flexed, really, you know, very, very forcible. And um, they, the patients will stiffen. Uh, this is where they will fall. And it's usually followed by this clonic, which means claw-like phase. So stiffening and then claw-like jerking uh, of all of the limbs. Um, they get a little blue in the face, not at the beginning, this is a mistake, but over here in this claw-like phase, because unfortunately it's so, the movements are so forcible uh, that they can't breathe uh, during this period of time. Now, fortunately, these seizures last, you know, 45 to 90, maybe 120 seconds. So, you know, three quarters of a minute, maybe up to two minutes. If it lasts more than two minutes, um, you should call 911. After it's over, there's a lot of drooling and saliva, uh, patients unresponsive. So what do you do? Uh, how do you provide first aid? Well, uh, just be with the patient um, here, uh, make sure that they're not hurting themselves, try to prevent the fall. You you're, uh, don't injure yourself, uh, it's hard. And if you're a, a little woman and you have, let's say you have a husband who's very big and is standing and has one of these, I, I understand that's really hard to, avoid injuring yourself. Just do the best you can to break their fall. Uh, protect the head uh, above all. Head and neck injuries uh, can occur um, and can be severe. So the head we want to watch out for. When you get into the postictal or after seizure uh, phase, the patient is kind of stuporous, almost like they're briefly in a coma. Get them on their side. Um, take this arm, pull it forward, and roll the patient to the, let's say it would be his right side in this case. That's so the saliva and the drool, and if there is any tongue biting, there's any blood, that'll go on to the floor. We can always clean the floor. You can, you can even rent a carpet cleaner if that's, if, but don't worry about that. What we don't want is all that fluid in the lungs where it could wind up later causing a pneumonia. Uh, open the airway by tipping the head up like this. Um, don't ever stick anything in their mouth. Do not stick your fingers. Do not stick a spoon. It is an old wives tale that people swallow their tongue. They do not. You cannot swallow your tongue, but the airway can be blocked. So if you tip, if their head's down, tip it up like that and get them on their side. Um, you, a lot of people will speak to them uh, during this period of time. They won't hear you until they're well into the recovery phase. Um, it is frightening to watch these and all uh, family members and uh, most nurses and doctors, quite honestly, and medics in ambulances are a bit frightened by this unless they're really used to it. So that's normal. Just try to take your own pulse and remember to do those things. So again, on the generalized category, they have the tonic clonic. You have the absence seizures down here that I talked about. And then third type I'll just mention, and then we'll move on, are these myoclonic seizures where you just get like you'll be sitting there, have a sudden jerk. Um, so different kinds of seizures, um, and that really helps us. I'll get into why in a minute. So I don't like the term seizure disorder. Um, you're welcome to use it if you want to, because sometimes uh, people uh, have old fashioned uh, thoughts that somehow epilepsy is related, you know, that, oh, you yeah, know, that's you know, demon possession or it's mental illness or it's um, intellectual thinking, you know, delays. Um, and, and that's not really true. I mean, some patients with epilepsy can have intellectual um, uh, 
issues or and, um, delays, uh, but it's certainly not a mental illness and it's, it's definitely not some sort of a religious experience or demon possession. Um, so uh, epilepsy is a term because it comprises more than just seizures, all of those things I talked about earlier. Again, if you in public want to refer to it as a seizure disorder with uh, schools or family members or employers, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But when we when we're here, we'll talk about epilepsy because we don't want to forget all the other problems that go along besides seizures. So I promised you uh, I would, that there are 40 kinds of seizures. There's no test at the end. We're not going to go through all of this. But uh, basically, the the way we classify the epilepsies is we first of all figure out what type of seizure you have, like I was describing. Then we plug in etiology means cause. What, what's the cause of this? Is there some structural problem with the brain? Yesterday I saw a new young man from Olympia, Washington, and he has uh, birth malformations that formed when he was a fetus in the womb. So that's a congenital structural problem with the brain. I mentioned that the generalized patients usually have genetics or family traits. If you've had meningitis or encephalitis, um, we don't know that COVID-19, uh, which is going on right now, will result in epilepsy, but we do know that it can affect the brain. So right now there's not enough known, but that's just, those are just examples of infectious process. And there's others, immune are very rare, but do occur. So we factor in the cause, we factor in the seizure types, we factor in the EEG and the MRI findings, um, and then we can pin down a type of epilepsy, maybe even specifically an epilepsy syndrome. And this is for the doctors, and I just want to point out that there are 40 kinds of epilepsy. Um, it's very complicated, and some neurologists like myself and um, two of my colleagues have gone on and done epilepsy fellowships. So we do our required medical school, internship, residency, so all of that takes about eight years uh, typically, and then some of us tack on an additional one to two years specifically in epilepsy. So you can bet that those doctors doctors study all of this, we have to be able to distinguish these different types of epilepsy. You don't. Um, so don't worry about this. And again, there's no test at the end. Okay, steps in choosing treatment. Um, so we, we, this is where the rubber meets the road. Okay, why do we spend all this time trying to figure out what type of seizure do you or your loved one have? Um, and sometimes seizures, you can have more than one seizure type. Uh, well, uh, that's important in selecting treatment. Also, identifying that epilepsy syndrome. Which of those 40 kinds of epilepsy does the person have? If they have um, um, infantile spasms, um, then that's a, there's a different treatment for that, like ACTH or Vigabatrin. If you have temporal lobe epilepsy, there's different, that's focal. You have different kinds of treatment for that. We can offer surgery in some cases for that. If you have um, occipital um, visual lobe epilepsy, we aren't going to do surgery on that because that you would lose your vision um, on one side of the brain. So choose, knowing what we're treating allows us to choose the right treatment. Our goals are simple to say, but sometimes hard to achieve. The goals are long-term seizure control, 100% seizure control, seizure freedom. That's what we're goal. That's what we want. That's that's the holy grail. We want uh, long-term benefits to your quality of life, right? Quality of life is what this is about. It's not just seizure control, but it's treatment of everything. Um, we have to take everything into consideration. We want safety for you. We don't want people getting injured. Sometimes uh, when people, particularly if they have um, the tonic-clonic convulsions, and especially if they have them at night, and especially if they're poorly controlled, they're at quite a bit higher risk of developing sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, known by the um, acronym SUDEP, S-U-D-E-P, SUDEP. It's rare, but it can happen. Um, and so that's an important thing uh, in addition to simply getting injured from falls um, or drowning or accidents, we have to worry about SUDEP, someone dying right during a seizure uh, from the seizure itself. So we can talk about more of that when we see people in the clinic and we, and we do go over that. I don't want to scare people, but it is something that we have to think about. 
one of the goals is to make it easy for us to, or easier for our patients to adhere, to stick to their treatment plan, um, education, tools to help them um, use the drugs appropriately, um, finding drugs that don't give them side effects that are bothersome. Uh, today, we're lucky enough to have now 30 three different anti-epileptic drugs. When I started in medicine in 1979, um, we had five basic drugs and some similarity ones, but basically five different drugs. Now we're up to 33 and many of these newer ones have much better side effect profiles. We also want no drug interactions. I recently saw a man this week who I um, who was on um, an older drug that um, uh, what it does is it um, increases how the liver get, was getting rid of his cholesterol medications. He could not get his cholesterol under control. They were talking about putting him on a really, really expensive new cholesterol medication. And I said, well, you know, why don't we just switch you to a modern seizure medicine and let's get you off this really old one from 1938. And let's see how that goes. He comes back to me and he was almost in tears. He was so happy. I got getting him off the old medicine and putting him on the new one meant his cholesterol had normalized, gone back to completely normal. He didn't even need his basic cholesterol medicine anymore. Um, so, you know, these are the kinds of things we can do um, sometimes to help our patients is to avoid these drug-drug interactions with each other. They're very common. And um, because now we have 33 seizure drugs and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of other drugs, it's uh, really important that we look at drug interactions. So that's how we build success and avoid failure. Okay, so uh, another busy slide. I'm sorry, but it's good news. Okay, this is good news. We have 33 drugs. If you look down here in black, okay, I started medical school in 1979. Uh, this one, Valproate, was approved in 1978. So the year before I started medical school, this is what we had. These are the old drugs. I said five, I guess there were whatever, seven. Uh, eight maybe. But uh, my point is, look at what's happened since then. We went through a 15-year period from Valproate to Felbamate. We didn't have anything new in 15 years. Nothing. We got Felbamate. And then we uh, in the 1990s, we got these. Um, and then since 19, let me think, uh, two, uh, sorry, pre-Gablin, that was 2005. Since 2005, to now, 15 years, an explosion of these drugs. And I'm really privileged that I came along, I was lucky in my career, I came along during this time. I've done research on almost, not quite, but almost every one of these drugs and I'm really proud to say that I have played a part. And uh, as have my patients and families who volunteered to do these research trials, thank you, because look at what we've done for the epilepsy community. So these are the old drugs, um, heavier drugs, uh, tougher drugs. Over here you see phenobarbital. This is a uh, bottle that was uh, produced in Bristol, Tennessee by the S.E. Massengill Company. That company's still around, makes uh, feminine products. I don't think they, well, I know they don't make drugs anymore. An old big bottle of phenobarbital. My point is that phenobarbital was developed the same year that the Titanic sank, the same year Girl Scouts of the USA was founded, 1912. We don't like to use phenobarbital, not just because it's an old drug, but it's a barbiturate. It's habit forming, it's sedating, and it has tons of drug-drug interactions. Uh, bromide salts are gone, by the way, but that was the very, very first anti-epileptic drug, um, and that was uh, an observation that a British physician made uh, named Lowcock. He made this observation in um, uh, homes uh, for people with disabilities and um, such, but uh, tough, tough medication to take. So some of these medicines we still use, but mm, sparingly. Um, now, there's all these newer medications. I'm just going to shoot through these. If you're a person with epilepsy or you know someone with epilepsy, some of these um, will look familiar. These are just generic names. Uh, you won't hear me use any of the brand names because I'm not here to promote brands. I'm here to use talk more a little bit about the generic or the scientific side of it. You can think of the generic names as kind of the um, chemical name of the medication. Uh, we also have devices. So I want to point out, and I'll talk about these a little bit later, um, the first uh, device we had approved was way up here, vagus nerve stimulation in 1997. 
guys, this isn't new. This has been around for 23 years. What is new is responsive neurostimulation. And what's very new is deep brain stimulation down here. So three types of stimulators are mixed in with these um, newer type drugs. This is complicated and this is something that I, when I was chair of the treatments committee and now I've been promoted to being vice chair of the clinical council of the American Epilepsy Society. Um, those are volunteer positions, by the way, and I do this work on the weekends. Um, it's my hobby to do this stuff. I prepared this big summary two years ago and we have um, a new summary because so much has changed uh, in the last two years. We have a new summary that will be coming out um, hopefully today. Um, and so that's available for doctors, healthcare providers, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, pharmacists, and hopefully everyone in the world will use it free of charge. Uh, and it's our service to the community of people with epilepsy and the people who care for them. So now, what about treatment? Okay. Um, we, we know that the risk uh, if, of somebody having a seizure uh, if they have a single seizure and they show up in the emergency room or they see us as a doctor, people ask, well, what's my chance of having another one? And should I start medication? We look at certain things. If the person has an MRI scan that shows um, some sort of scar tissue from a brain injury, or they have a small tumor or a blood vessel tangle, or maybe they had a stroke, or maybe they had meningitis, like I said, an infection, uh, that doubles the risk of having a second seizure, and we will put them on seizure medication. Likewise, if they have epileptic brain waves on their EEG, that's something we really should put them on uh, seizure medication for because they're at increased risk. And if the seizure was at night, um, uh, that also increases the risk for reasons we don't know. But if it's a nighttime seizure or a seizure during sleep, yes, we should treat the person. Um, Treatment helps. Um, yes, the drugs do have side effects. Um, now, in patients who are, uh, have a severe head injury and um, uh, have to be hospitalized, there's no evidence that treating them prevents epilepsy. So we used to call these anti-epileptic drugs, and we don't anymore. We call them anti-seizure medications because they're not anti-epileptic. They don't stop epilepsy, unfortunately they stop seizures. Uh, we were looking for a drug that will actually prevent epilepsy. That would be wonderful um, if there was a clinical medicine Nobel Prize. In my opinion, um, they, the, the researcher would, oh, they should get a Nobel Prize if they can come up with a medication that will stop epilepsy. I fully believe that will help, or excuse me, that will happen sometime. Okay, moving on now, we're closing in on the end of the talk. Uh, I want to bring up surgery, not to scare anybody, but to um, hopefully just give you a little bit of information about it. And first of all, to understand that this is not new, okay? Temporal lobectomies were done <clears throat> by uh, Dr. Victor Horsley in London in 1870. This is before any kind of brain imaging. This is before EEG. EEG wasn't invented until the 1930s, so he was 60 years ahead of his time. He found out that if someone had something wrong with their temporal lobe and they had horrible seizures and they couldn't stop, taking it out left them free of seizures. And he was right. So 1870, that's 150 years ago that we've been doing epilepsy surgery. It's a lot more advanced now than then, but it's important to understand that it does work. And I'll show you some information on that. Lesionectomy means taking out a lesion, a brain tumor, a blood vessel tangle. And we do those things all the time here at Valley Medical Center. Uh, that's important. Removing part of the cortex, uh, just if it's just epileptic, maybe there's nothing physically wrong with it, uh, but that's electrically bad, we can remove that too. These are rarer procedures, so I won't spend time on those. But I do want to talk about the last four because these are really the new kids on the block. I mentioned vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, a little pacemaker-like device is put in the left upper chest and the wire attaches to the vagus nerve, sending signals intermittently to the brain to kind of dampen down seizures. It doesn't go directly into the brain, it's just on a nerve that goes to the brain. So it's on kind of a root, if you will, uh, but it goes up the trunk to the, the tree, if you want to think of it that way. 
Responsive neurostimulation is an interesting uh, device. This is on the brain. Uh, it's put in the skull. It's a, it's a, a metal device. It's put in the skull. Um, and the uh, electrode leads go in either onto the surface of the brain or deep into the brain. And I'll show you a picture on that. And that's really exciting as well. The third stimulation uh, stimulator is down at the bottom. This is deep brain stimulation. And that was approved um, just last year. And uh, we just implanted, um, put one in our first patient in Washington state. She's a patient of mine. In fact, I saw her yesterday for her second uh, post-surgery visit. Um, she has one of those birth malformations of the brain and wasn't a candidate to have it taken out because it's right in her hand and arm and face movement area and it would paralyze her. Plus it's a very large malformation uh, spanning a very large area. So we couldn't really do surgery on it. She wasn't a candidate for the responsive neurostimulator because the area was too big. Um, so we did deep brain stimulation with her. She came back yesterday and her mom was just so excited. Now it's early. She just had this, you know, the stimulator implanted um, on July 23rd. Um, she had me program it, turn it on on August 14th and today's uh, September 11th. Um, so it's a little bit early to say, but her mother and she feel like it really has helped her uh, quite a bit already. Um, so we'll talk about that briefly and also laser um, surgery. People have been asking for years about, hey, can you do laser surgery? And until about seven, give or take years ago, uh, the answer was no, it really didn't have a place, but it does have a small role. We'll talk about that. Now, I, I don't want to uh, get you guys hung up on the technicalities, but this is a super important uh, research study that was done in Canada by my good friend, Dr. Sam Weeb, who is president now of the International League Against Epilepsy. This was a study where they had in Canada patients who needed temporal lobe surgery to remove the temporal lobe because of uh, seizures that are can't be stopped. It was an interesting study because um, Canada has completely socialized medicine, as you know, and uh, patients have to wait for surgery in Canada. In fact, they have to wait two years. If, if, if I was a Canadian physician and I said to you, you're a candidate for temporal lobectomy right now, uh, great, but you have to wait two years to get the surgery because that's how socialized medicine in Canada works. There's a big delay. So Dr. Weeb had an ingenious idea. He said, look, I'm going to take uh, 80 patients who are candidates for surgery today, and half of them, I'm going to randomize it, the computer will tell me, half of them will have to wait the normal two years, but the other half will get fast track to surgery right now. And that way, those will get surgery, and we'll compare the seizure-free outcome, how many of those patients who have seizure surgery, excuse me, how many of those patients who have surgery now are seizure-free, uh, out two years out, compared to um, the ones who have to wait two years. And they found a huge difference. Only 8% in the medical group were seizure free, whereas in the surgical group, um, actually, if you look at the people who got surgery, it was actually 64%. Um, so uh, it proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that temporal lobe surgery works. We did a study here. I was the Pacific Northwest investigator, and um, I wasn't among the lead authors here, but I'm in the back among the lead investigators. Um, we did the study and published it in the Journal American Medical Association and said, well, you know, Dr. Weeb's study looked at patients who had had epilepsy in our average of 20 to 25 years. What if we look at these patients earlier on when they've only had bad uncontrolled seizures for no more than two years? So early surgery. Does early surgery work and does it harm the patients? Well, this was our study um, and these are the only two randomized controlled studies of surgery. And what we found, oh, I, I guess I have it here, um, is not one patient in the medical group was seizure free, but 85% in the surgical group were seizure free at one year. So if you do statistics and you look at the odds ratio, it's infinite. There's infinite benefit. <laughs> well, it's because nobody in the medical group was seizure free. Had we been able to do a larger study, I'm sure we might have found one or 2% in the medical group that were seizure free. Um, so the odds ratio would have had an actual number, not infinity. 
the point is the American um, uh, Academy of Neurology, American Epilepsy Society, and the American Association of Neurological Surgeons has a practice parameter for doctors which says, if your patient has temporal lobe epilepsy and meets certain criteria, around two thirds of those patients will become completely seizure free. Uh, more importantly, there's quality of life benefits that we see. There's a trend toward better social functioning um, after surgery. And the chances of surgical complications, something going wrong with surgery, and the chance of death are much smaller compared to the risks that patients have if they continue to have seizures. Among those is that sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. In the uh, those research trials I talked about, there was one death. It was in the medical group, people that the person that didn't have surgery because they had died unexpectedly from a seizure in their sleep. So the surgery should be considered. And I understand, uh, I've been doing this for a long, long time. Here in Washington State, I came here in 1987 and never left. I've been doing this here in this, this state in the Seattle area for a very long time, 33 plus years. And uh, people are really scared to have big time brain surgery and I, and I totally get that. And it does have some risks. Doing nothing has risks though. Do we have a more minor option? Yeah, there's this laser ablation. Um, and so a laser probe, I'm gonna show you up here on the left, a laser probe is put deep into the brain. It's positioned. Um, the, the neurosurgeon here is operating in the MRI suite, not in an actual operating room, but a sterile area in imaging. And he or she uh, turns on the laser beam and it's controlled. They can watch uh, the heating of the brain um, under the MRI. It is totally amazing. And they watch it on a screen. Um, so it's not robotic surgery. It's controlled by a human, but it's monitored with computers, temperature probes, and those kinds of things. And it, it basically coagulates the, the spot in the brain um, that is causing the seizures. Now, most of the time we can't find, we can't pinpoint it to a very small little spot like that. Um, but when we can, this might be an option. So it's MRI guided, it's MRI monitored. You can imagine this is much less invasive than typical surgery. Now, this is a little gory looking at something, you know, stuck in somebody's head. But the, my point is this, when, when the surgeon takes this probe out, guess what they put on the scalp? A Band-Aid. I'm not kidding. This is not your major brain operation and your whole head's wrapped up and you have tremendous pain. There's a Band-Aid on the scalp and they go home typically the next day, which does not happen with the big surgeries we traditionally do. We often offer this in the left temporal lobe epilepsy because for most of us, the left temporal area is our language area. I'm using my left temporal lobe here. Um, during this talk to get all of my words out and organize my thoughts so that you can understand it. And you comprehend what I'm saying if you speak English because you're using your left temp temporal lobe for comprehension. You can imagine if we do surgery on the left temporal lobe, we're very concerned about uh, causing language problems. So when we use the laser probe, we know that there are fewer language problems. But the caveat or the concern is it may be less effective. Uh, so it's kind of like if you think about it, an analogy would be maybe knee surgery. Uh, maybe you go in for lap, uh, lap or, not laparoscopic, uh, or arthroscopic surgery with a scope and they clean up some of the tissue that's bad and maybe try to fix some tendons while they're in there. Maybe the meniscus needs some trimming. It's, it's a minor procedure, but you know it might be a reasonable first step before going to full knee replacement. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you should do if you have knee surgery, I don't, I don't know, that's not my area. But my point is, you can understand this is a more minor procedure and it could be a good place to start. And if it cures your epilepsy, fantastic. You hallelujah, right? We scored, <laughs> that's what we want, seizure freedom. And if we can do it with a lesser procedure, great. Now, lots of patients aren't candidates for um, surgery of any kind for reasons I kind of talked about before. We're almost at the end of the talk. Uh, so this is the responsive neural stimulator. And um, um, uh, I mentioned that we have the deep brain stimulator and I 
had the first device in Washington State put in a patient um, two months ago. This is uh, uh, an interesting device. I was the investigator on this, and um, I had the first device put in the first human being in the world in 2004. This was a clinical trial that I was involved in at that time. And um, basically, in this um, device here, which is in the skull, it's smooth, it doesn't stick out, it's recessed into the skull, so it's flat. Um, there's a battery. There is a bank of EEG amplifiers, which are recording signals from eight different electrode contacts, either strip electrodes on the outside of the brain or depth electrodes that penetrate into the brain. So those recordings are made from those with the EEG. There's a computer that analyzes it. I program uh, that to correctly analyze the patient's seizures. And then once it says, yes, that's a seizure, it meets the criteria that the doctor set up, then it actually shocks the brain five times, boom, 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 um, to stop the seizure. Um, it's not 100% effective, but it is an option um, that can help. It doesn't leave people seizure-free. None of the stimulators leave people completely seizure-free, but they can be used in place of some medications now, keep in mind, most patients have to take a regular seizure medicine in addition to the stimulator, but maybe not so many medicines, right? If they can have a stimulator and that's helping, that's doing some of the lifting, and then the medications are doing some lifting, hopefully the heavy lift with both of those different kinds of treatments will get patients over the hump and get them, uh, maybe not seizure-free, but hopefully, excuse me, hopefully improved. And then finally, deep brain stimulation. Again, um, this is uh, what we did with my patient, my colleague, uh, Dr. Andrew Coe at University of Washington Medical Center, Montlake, um, implanted uh, the first person in Washington State uh, with this device um, on uh, uh, July 23rd. And, um, and she's doing well, is a little pacemaker device. All of these stimulators have a pacemaker device in the chest area, the wires go up, uh, under the skin. They're uh, tunneled up under the skin. In this case, goes up to the scalp and then to a hole uh, through which the electrode passes, and this actually stimulates the brain um, to try to stop seizures. And this is good for seizures that are maybe coming from big areas of the brain where other options don't exist. So uh, I really appreciate your attention. It's my pleasure, my passion, and my lifetime desire to help people with epilepsy and as I say, we are in, involved in all of these treatments. We treat um, babies, uh, premature babies, you know, infants, toddlers, young children, adolescents, adults of all ages, uh, kids of all ages, if you will. Uh, we have a team, myself, um, Dr. Babaraj Thankapan, who trained at uh, Cleveland Clinic, um, Dr. Krista Kalguchi, trained at University of Washington and other programs, Dr. Kevin Joseph, was at Nationwide Children's in Washington, D.C. Dr. Pipalusek, who trained at U University of California, Irvine, and San Diego. Dr. Branding Bennett, who came from UCLA and um, Washington University in St. Louis, uh, all playing roles in adult neurology, child neurology, neurosurgery, neuropsychology. Uh, we have Shannon Huffaker um, and two other research assistants who uh, help me run the clinical trials. Um, the, uh, right now we're doing, uh, we have six different medication trials that are going on. So for patients who really have tried uh, almost everything and are struggling, we do have clinical research trials. We have a, a bank of, a group of fantastic senior uh, EEG technologists, we have social workers and pharmacologists that work with us. So again, it's my pleasure. We're here. We're a accredited level four center. There's only four uh, NAEC accredited level four surgical epilepsy centers in the Washington, Alaska, Idaho, Montana area, and we're one of those four. So we're here to help, and we really appreciate your attention. And please let us know your questions, and um, hopefully we'll hear from you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bossler. And for those of you who are watching, if you have questions about our program or specifically for Dr. Bossler, you're welcome to add them into the comments of the video application if you're watching on YouTube or on our Valley blog, and then we can direct those uh, to Dr. Bossler. Thanks again.